actually went to college to study performing classical music with a particular interest in opera with an intention to find performance work professionally once I was finished with school. And then the pandemic hit and the government got really, really stingy with giving money to the arts and a bunch of theaters and opera houses closed down possibly forever. So I turned to Patreon work. Uh, it's kind of like when a ballet dancer uh, can't find any work in the ballet, so she becomes a stripper, except that it is significantly less profitable. Whenever I meet new people and I, I tell them that I studied opera, the response is usually like, what? And why? Uh, and occasionally you get the, oh, wow, you must really love that. I could never do that, <laughs> which then I pretend isn't an insult. But sometimes people will really earnestly tell me that they actually really want to get into opera and they always thought it was sort of cool conceptually, but that they don't know where to start. And they really tried to get into it. They tried to watch that recording of the magic flute that was free on YouTube and they just couldn't really get that far into it. And they don't know why, but how did how did I get into it? How do you get into it? I think there's a couple big reasons why people struggle with opera, and if I just go over those, then I might actually be able to give some useful advice on how you might be able to get into opera. Allow me to extrapolate. Reason one, it's super, super old. And this is the big one. The first opera was published in 1597 by a dude named Jacopo Perry, who referred to himself as Il Zazzarino, which is a dope pen name and makes me wish I hadn't settled for Hatchet. The golden age of opera, the classical period, ran from about 1750 to about 1800. Most of the operatic canon that runs in opera houses, and that's free on YouTube for you to watch, is more than 200 years old. The problem with music that's 200 years old is that it belongs to a genre of music that you have no familiarity with because it is long gone. You don't know what that genre is and you don't know anything that's related to that genre. And it doesn't fuck and it doesn't bop. You know how the pacing in movies from the 50s and 60s is like super weird and slow and boring and it just kind of meanders around for two hours and then it just ends? Those stories are only 50 or 60 years old. 60 or 70, oh my God. Mozart was sort of the pinnacle of the classical period, and he had already written ten full operas before a bunch of rich white colonialist fucks decided to write the Declaration of Independence. We don't dress like this anymore, and we don't listen to music like this anymore. Not to wax philosophical, but opera comes from a time before electric lights. Once the sun went down, your day was basically over. Also, not to generalize about how people had less to do in the old days, but before the Industrial Revolution, people had a lot more free time and a lot less to do with it. Theater and entertainment from this era is longer in the tooth because it served a different purpose at a time when it was coming out than the entertainment that we have coming out now. In 2019, you know, you've got a dozen films coming out every week and each one is competing with the others to be snappier, to bring in an audience that doesn't actually want to be inconvenienced for more than a few Hour. Films have to burn bright, impress quickly, and, at best, sell repeat tickets. In the 1700s, this was not the energy. Do you know what I mean? At a time when people did not have access to regular entertainment, going to the theater was a special occasion because it was a way to pass long periods of time whilst being entertained. Today we are entertained literally constantly, like, I remember having a conversation with my father about the last time he remembers ever being bored, and it was just before the invention of smartphones. That's not a bad thing, by the way. Uh, I'm not saying society is going to shit because we all be on our cell phones too much. Like, I'm not gonna say that. I'm not fucking Banksy. But the culture that we're in has been fundamentally changing for the better part of a century faster than it ever has before. The typical film that you go to see is somewhere between 90 and 120 minutes long. Anything that goes over two hours starts to make theaters very nervous. For contrast, most operas from the golden era were two and a half to four hours long. 
This is an absolutely miserable length of time for modern audiences to sit through. Operas done at major opera houses will have to figure out what to cut. This is mostly because if you ask an audience to sit through four hours of sung, long, character-driven dialogue scenes in an archaic language where everything is repeated four or five times in a genre of music that you might not even like, yeah, um, opera tickets are a hard sell already. However, if we are going to focus simply on the genre of music, and you have maybe listened to a classical song before and enjoyed it and thought I enjoyed this, but I don't know where to get more of it because when I like it on Spotify, Spotify just asks me if I want some instrumental covers of pop songs. Am I the only person this happens to? I have all of Handel's water music on loop, just constantly. And Spotify is like, oh, do you want Fall Out Boy's Centuries? But it's being played on a cello. I'm going to go over some very, very broad periods of music so that you might have more of an idea of what era you actually like the sound of. All the way at the top, pre-opera, we've got medieval or renaissance sound. Primarily what you're going to hear is either church pieces or madrigals. Magical music in particular is sort of your secular polyphonic music with some dope lutes and complex peppy rhythmic motifs. You're not likely to find magical style in opera since its heyday ended about when opera began. But some of El Zazzarino's work and some of his uh, contemporaries, like Claudio Monteverdi, are inspired or influenced by this sound. Just missed you, magicals. Sorry. Baroque music. <laughs> you know what they say about Baroque music. If it's not Baroque, don't fix it! This is your J.S. Bach, your Vivaldi, Scarlatti, Purcell, your woody, almost hollow sound. The heyday of the recorder, 150 years long. What an elegant, earnest, beautiful piece of instrument. The tragedy of knowing that it will be exclusively used by fifth graders for the next hundred years. For now she shines bright in her majesty and her splendor. I don't want to say that rhythmic structures become more simplistic during this period, but they do become a lot more structured. No longer does music sound like five to seven individual voices overlapping with semi-related musical ideas. We have entered the era of paint-by-the-numbers four-part harmony. The Baroque marks that weird period of European music where, like, the Enlightenment period was happening, and everybody was trying to figure out how to apply mathematic principles to music, and then use the math to solve the music. As a result, you lose some of the more complex rhythmic and melodic structures that come from the aural tradition, which... I'm not gonna go into that right now, that's a video all by itself. I'll stay away from discussing music theory beyond saying that this is about when compositions move from the modal theory to the tonal theory. Uh, for you laymen out there, this is the move to a standardized do re mi scale. And I'm like a, like a bunch of other stuff, guys. Like a bunch, like a lot of other stuff. I'm spending a little extra time talking about the Baroque period because this is about as early as you're going to get with opera. The oldest opera that we have completely intact is Eurydice, written by Jacopo Perry, who also wrote the oldest opera I've now lost to time, Daphne. Probably the most famous opera of this period is Monteverdi's L'Orfeo, as it finalized a lot of the things that we would later see as standards for operatic structure. There are a couple English language operas being written at this time, notably Henry Purcell is active. Uh, and you may want to check out Dido and Aeneas. Oh, by the way, I'm going to include links in the description to free productions of, like, every opera that I mentioned that I can actually find free productions of, which, 
for most of these older ones is, is, is very easy. I've actually been posting them on my Twitter as I've been, um, as I've been doing research for this. The classical period. The golden age of opera. Featuring Mozart. And... And Mozart. Haydn and Schubert and Salieri, Rossini and Gluck and debatably Beethoven. The big invention of the classical period is that they started to write songs that sounded like songs. That is not a joke, and I wish that it was. The transition from Baroque to classical is usually defined as a transition to more song-like textures. Basically, Baroque operas are supposed to sound like a ubiquitous musical texture with lots of grandeur and slow-moving lines, and classical operas have, like, songs. You know, songs with, like, melodies and stuff. There's also a major change in instrumentation around this time, specifically the movement from the harpsichord to the pianoforte. This doesn't sound like a big deal, because maybe you've heard a harpsichord and you're like, what's the big deal? It's just a piano that sounds shittier. Like, you're not wrong, but you are also wrong. The major difference between a harpsichord and a pianoforte is that a harpsichord plucks notes and a pianoforte strikes notes. Imagine a harp for a second. It's tall and you hold it like this. You got it. See, when you pluck a string on the harp, you have two options. You can either let the string keep reverberating until it eventually comes to a stop on its own, or you can dampen it manually so that you can pluck it again. The piano is basically a harp that is trapped inside a wooden box, which means that you can't dampen those notes after they've been plucked. They must finish reverberating on their own. The movement to hammers means that the string is automatically dampened when the key is released. That means you can hit the same note over and over and over again with no breaks in between. Ah, the sound of the classical period has arrived. The temptation to just recommend Mozart operas is completely overwhelming, um, but I will, I will give Rossini a, a fighting chance and me also mention The Barber of Seville. As for Mozart, if you're a goth, you should try Don Giovanni. If you're a normal person, then Maybe The Marriage of Figaro. <laughs> Another good way to see if you like Mozart is uh, just to go watch Amadeus. And if you like some of those musical, musical numbers in there, go watch that opera. It's probably pretty good. You can do the same thing for Salieri. I think a couple of his operas actually get mentioned in Amadeus too, because he's, he's in it. Now that we're through with those, we're moving into some music that you might actually like. I'm talking Verdi, baby, Donizetti, Wagner, Puccini. It's the century of the Romantics, bitch. The Romantic period is marked by expressive, emotive musical lines. Remember the math from the Baroque period? Well, we're done with her. We're not using math anymore. But oh, we're still kind of using math. I think Romantic music can sound kind of slow, and sleepy to modern listeners. Um, these are the lo-fi, chill beats of archaic music styles. But a big part of romantic operas is that the libretto now has to be matched with music that sort of fits it emotionally. The music now has to express the meaning of the word that it is playing alongside. We are also starting to get some more original storylines in our opera. See, during the Baroque and Classical period, the church was real nervous about opera, and sort of to pacify the church a little bit, most opera followed storylines from like Shakespeare or ancient Greek plays. Um, and I don't know what was going on with the church in the 1800s, um, but they really eased up on all of their rules, and people were like, cool, I get to do whatever I want now. So what's the point of this conversational cul-de-sac? Well, it's because we're getting high melodrama, baby. She's here. Melodrama is here. My go-to recommendation from this period, and actually
actually my go-to recommendation for anyone who is getting interested in starting out on opera is Janiskiki by Giacomo Puccini. It's 45 minutes to an hour long, depending on how quickly they take the music. It is through composed and it's funny. If you're looking for something a little more dramatic, Puccini did La Boheme. That one's about people dying of tuberculosis of the throat. Mm. A fun romp, one might say. The tragedy of the century is uh, Lucia de Lamamor by Gaetano Donizetti? Gaetano? 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 I'm just gonna assume that I pronounced it perfectly. The Chia de la Amour might be for you if you're really into like gothic horror because it has a lot of those gothic horror elements to it. It's got a very Frankenstein, Dracula, bad woman in the attic kind of energy to it. And it's about the Scots and they're not gonna handle that sensitively. I would be remiss if I didn't talk about the early 1900s. So let's talk about the early 1900s, particularly American operas. There are jazz operas. There are blues operas. There are jazz and blues and art music operas coming out of America at this time. I will point you in the general direction of Porgy and Bess by George Gershwin. Yes, that George Gershwin. And Street Scene by Kurt Vile. Around this time, the Princess Theatre in America was starting to develop and stage the first proper American musicals, which were tenuously different from opera in the early years, but became more and more so over the next few decades. The sound from those shows is mostly drawn from Gilbert and Sullivan, who were writing operas in the 1890s. If you're interested in that sort of early theatrical sound, you might want to check out some operas by Gilbert and Sullivan, like The Pirates of Penzance, or... Princess Ida, nailed it. There are some modern operas as well. They are very avant-garde and they are difficult to get a hold of. I wish that I could recommend The Medium, uh, by G.C. Minotti, uh, which is again a gothic horror opera about a woman who pretends to be psychic and is also abusive to her uh, mentally disabled son, I think. But she scares herself to death. <laughs> Classic women, am I right? I personally really want to watch Philip Glass's Akhenaten, uh, which is a 1984 opera about Akhenaten. It is composed entirely in Akkadian and Hebrew. The problem with productions by living composers, though, is that it's very difficult to get access to them legally, even if you really want to. Musical theater kids who are too poor to go to New York know my struggle. I know that the men did a production of Akhenaten, like, I think two seasons ago, and it looks really, really good. I want to watch it, but they don't have it anywhere for sale, and they're not putting it on YouTube, so there's not really a market of bootlegs for it either, so I guess I'll just watch the trailer on YouTube a lot and wish that I could watch it. I can't! With living composers, there's a lot of concern over people getting the correct credit and financial accountability it is thundering. Most opera houses don't have the money to do that, and so most operas that you have access to are ones where the composers are not still living. So most operas that you can get for free are old, and they're genres that you don't like. Anyway, let's round this out with some other reasons that opera can be kind of hostile to new viewers. Reason number two that you don't, that opera's not very friendly to you is that you don't know the stories or what's going on. Early opera was originally written by Jacopo Perry and a couple other dudes who were trying to do the same thing at the same time in an attempt to return to the staging and art style of ancient Greek theater. It was basically assumed in the 1500s that the reason Greek theater was written in rhyme was because it was supposed to have been sung originally, 
We now know that this is not true. It was probably more likely recited. And so to make it as authentic as possible, all early opera was based on Greek mythology. This is a standby of opera through basically all of the Baroque period, from Eurydice, which is our first full-length opera that survives to this day, to L'Orfeo, which is the same story told by a different dude. The audience was expected to already be familiar with the premise, to know exactly what to expect, and to know what the story was, and simply sit there and enjoy the way that it was told. As opera got more and more established through the Baroque and classical periods, there was less of a need to have that veneer of classical art prestige, and stories started to move away from just doing ancient mythology, but they didn't really move away from retellings of popular stories. There are operas that are new or original stories, but a lot of those operas are now really established. Like, if you go to see La Boheme, the production company is just going to assume that you, the kind of person buying a ticket to go see La Boheme, already knows what happens in La Boheme. You go to an opera house, they give you a pamphlet, and they're like, the story's in here. Read it before you start watching. And you're like, what? <laughs> they don't do this in Hades Town, And that's the same thing. Anyway, the point of all of this is that operas kind of don't care if you understand what's going on and at no point do they take the time to like actually try and explain their stories very well and they don't make sure you're clear on who the characters are or the stakes or why people care about this or that or what's going on or anything they don't explain anything another huge aspect of this is that similar to the Commedia dell'arte there's an assumption that the viewer will understand the unspoken language of character voices. See, in opera, your range dictates the kind of character that you get to play. If you're a lyric soprano, you can be the ingenue, or the protagonist, or the young woman. And if you're a coloratura soprano, you can be a, a queen, or a mother-in-law, or a... a or a mean woman, <laughs> a, a shrill, angry woman, or if you're a dramatic soprano, you can be a viking or a goddess, and if you're a mezzo-soprano, you can be a man. If you were going to see an opera, just hearing the range, you would know what kind of character they are supposed to be. There is a level of subtext that simply does not exist for modern viewers, because like, I don't know that a coloratura is supposed to always be a good guy. I don't know if it's good or bad that that baritone can hit a really, really low note. It is assumed that you understand that these are character beats, that the range is part of the character, but you don't. This is not a language that you have access to. Also, none of this is helped by the fact that the stories in opera are all fucking bonkers, and none of them make any sense 90% of the time. The thing is, the story isn't really the point. It's the point. Some opera, sure. Like, Janiskiki is like, oops, all story, mostly because it's Puccini's divine comedy fan fiction. Actually, can we take a sidebar and talk about Janiskiki for a second? The fact that Puccini read the Divine Comedy and got super obsessed with a minor character who appears in one, one line of poetry and then decided to write an entire fan fiction about how actually he was in the right for robbing those rich people and he was actually, he was actually justified because the super rich are evil and decided to build a whole complex inner life for a dude who, again, is in one sentence of a massive poem like the Divine Comedy. Mm. Okay. Anyway, the point of an opera is not really to absorb a story. You go to see an opera so that you can watch highly skilled professionals do a thing that you cannot do. You sit in a dark room, in a comfortable chair, 
for four hours so that you can watch people who spent at least four and probably closer to 12 years studying music and performance as they dance for your amusement. More on that in a while. First, I'm gonna go into my third and final reason for why you don't like opera, and it's the language barrier. And I'm not even just talking about subtitles, although apparently for most Americans, that is actually the end of the conversation. The thing is, an opera is not a musical. You are not supposed to play along at home. There's a conversation that came up a lot when we as a culture were experiencing the Cats movie. The problem with musical movies, and particularly with dance musicals being adapted from the stage to screen, is that in the silver screen allows for a level of suspended disbelief that literally cannot exist in the meat space. If you are in a room with a person who is doing a highly technical tap routine, a thing that you cannot do, which requires visible dexterity and skill, that is a very impressive thing to watch. You are watching a person do a thing that you cannot do and that you can visibly see is highly impressive and highly technical. You can understand that they have acquired that skill through an absurd amount of practice, time, and effort. If you are watching a tap dancer in a film, you can think, well, she had as many chances as she needed to do that correctly. Maybe she did a bunch of takes and then they just spliced them all together. Or you can think, well, they have stage doubles and stuff. They have stunt doubles. Uh, it could be somebody else. I'm not seeing her whole body. That could be somebody else. It's not actually her. Or you could even be thinking like, well, that could be animated. That could be CGI. That's probably not even real. It's not real. It isn't real. It doesn't feel real. There's a natural devaluation of hard-earned performance skills in a world where you can always see the very best of the best and you are always going to be unimpressed by them. You maybe see where I'm going with this. Operatic music is designed to be highly impressive and to require an extremely high level of skill. It is show-offy, it's big, it's loud, it's beautiful, and it goes on and on and on and on. It's not unusual for an aria from the classical period to take six, eight, ten minutes to get when you're in the room with someone who is singing these pieces, there's a hugely physical aspect to the power of these vocalists. They hit a high note and all the hairs on your arms stand on end and you can feel the reverberations of the sound going through you like water. Unfortunately, if you're not in a room with these musicians, and none of us should be right now, that feeling is completely lost. And you're just listening to people hitting high notes, and you're like, eh, I can get this from an Ariana Grande song. Now that's music. The other thing about these songs being so technical and so highly impressive technically is that if you're listening to them, you know, in the car, you can't participate. These are pieces of music that require real practice and skill and years of training. It feels very exclusive. You can't sing along with an operatic CD. You are supposed to sit and listen to it. And that's not really how we want to engage with music right now. The thing that popular music and that musical music has up over opera is that it's accessible. Anybody can listen to it, you can learn all the words, you can sing along, you can pretend to be one of the characters. You feel as though you are a part of that music because it is not inaccessible to you because it is learnable. Operatic music is not. Basically, the problem with opera and the reason that it's not accessible for you and that you don't enjoy it is because you're not seeing it live. And unfortunately, you kind of can't right now. If things ever go back to the way they were, and that is a big if, my advice is to go see some opera live. I don't think you should spend money going to the Met or going to the Royal Opera House. I don't think you should buy a ticket somewhere. I think you should find a university that is kind of near you and see if their music department is putting on an opera and you should go see that. 
It will cost you very, very little. It will very likely have been translated into English, and it will be severely cut. Like, super, super abridged. You will not be watching the whole thing, because, um, they don't have the budget to do the whole thing, or the time. They usually have, like, one semester to put it together. The thing is, if you don't study classical music, you probably don't have the discernment between a student who's pretty good and a professional who spent their whole life training. They're both gonna seem about the same level of great as long as you're in the room with them. That's the most important thing, and it's the thing we can't do right now. Mm. When I got to the end of this essay, I actually got super depressed. Um, Mostly because it's such a foregone conclusion. No one's ever going to talk to me about my special interest. Ooh. Tune in next month when I decide to write a whole long ass essay about Porgy and Bess instead of a book. Again, I feel like you're looking at me right now just like, yes, girl, give us your lack of energy. Give us nothing. <sighs> I'm gonna go eat a salad. Hi. Do you like all my necklaces, by the way? They're like choking me out. They're unpleasantly tight.